Hello again, my friends, ready for video number five in our chemical reaction series. This will be a quick one, just kind of one simple little extension more towards a real life or laboratory uh, situation. You'll hear this term percent yield thrown around, especially if you're in organic chemistry. What was your percent yield? You see this in industry a lot too. You're taking some you know, raw materials and producing a product. Well, how effective is your process, right? If you're, you know, we'll go through this and we'll talk about the ramifications of these things. But in general chemistry, less of a thing. We usually don't worry about it as much. Percent yield. Think of it as like, okay, I'm supposed to get this much. How much did I really get? That, that, that's the question. So here's the two, uh, you know, terms we'll use. And we've already seen the first one, maximum theoretical yield. When I introduce stoichiometry to you, when you theoretically take, take a, an equation, right? You're not, you didn't actually do it. You haven't run it in lab. You're just saying, hey, if I've got this much of reactants, whether it's a limiting reactant problem or not, how much product can I get? Theoretically, in a perfect world, nothing weird happens. In an ideal perfect world, how much product can form? What you calculate stoichiometrically is the maximum theoretical yield. Right? We just, but we usually don't call it that. We're just saying, how much can you get? And we're always assuming it's maximum theoretical yield. But if you're like me and you actually go in the lab and do it, you never get that number, like ever. Because <laughs> I, I spaz out a lot in my brain. I get distracted readily. And, you know, there's other people in lab. How was your day? What are you up to? Oh, I spilled. You know, you forget to condition something or you get some. Maybe the side of a beaker's a little dirty or whatever, and you get a side reaction on there that produces a product you weren't supposed to get in the first place, or you get a side reaction going, you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? You know, when you're you know using gravity filtration to to get maybe a precipitate out, you know, some of it sticks to the side of your stirring, or I mean it's like what crap happens, right? <laughs> so what you act, let's say we do this reaction in the lab and run it. As we should have, as theoretically, we calculated it. We take the same starting masses as we calculated earlier, and we do it, and we get a different number, not what we predicted. That's your actual yield, the amount you actually collect from an experiment. Almost always, that's going to be lower than what you predicted it was going to be in the maximum theoretical yield. Welcome to the real world! It's a good Mr. Mr. song, by the way. Sometimes you get more as an experiment we do that's almost, it's designed to have a lot of errors. So that the point of the lab is not to do great. It's to figure out why you didn't do great. And we do this whole logistical error analysis uh, afterwards. It's a good way to think as a chemist saying, hey, if this error occurred, would that give me more of what I'm supposed to get or less or have no effect? Right? It's important to think about the ramifications of errors that you make. Um, you could predict ahead of time or after you're done, you got, hey, I got less than I was supposed to. What happened? Or I got more. What happened? There could be a side reaction that gives you a heavier product, right? And so you end up getting like 105% yield. You're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So percent yield is just that ratio of what you actually got over what you're supposed to get. Right? So percent yield will just be the actual yield, what you collect and measure right, in a laboratory, divided by the maximum theoretical yield, what you were supposed to get. What you got over what you were supposed to get, and that gives you a ratio. Let's times that by that uh, exact number, 100. That converts that, that ratio, that fraction, into a percent. And ideally, we get 100%, but almost never. So I've done somewhere I got like 105%. I'm like, ah, oh, man, what, what did I blow my nose in it or something? <laughs> Not that you would do that. Um, in Breaking Bad, there's uh, he's very careful. If you look, there's scenes where he's creating that blue product. <laughs> and he's very careful on what he's making to make it pure or not pure. Um, and he's able to make it just incredibly high purity because he's able to limit these side reactions that can occur. And he gets better reactants, higher quality reactants. Great TV show, by the way. Um, so anyway, simple concept. But if you're an organic, synthetic organic chemist, which I am not, a lot of times you're taking you know a certain amount of material and trying to synthesize or create a drug or some kind of product, and you'd like to know if your reaction produces 100%, right? So if I take you know X amount of this, I'm supposed to get Y amount of that. Do I? If not, can I make that more efficient by changing the reaction pathway? Not my forte, right? Or if you're out in industry, you know, say you have 100, 100 pounds of raw material and you're supposed to get, based on your calculations, 50 pounds of product that you can go sell, but you only get 25. 
25 over 50, that's only 50% yield. You're wasting half of your reactants. You're just burning money, man. Your profit just... So you want to you wanna make sure that you're more efficient. So maybe it's a whole different process you need. Maybe something's wrong with your equipment. Maybe something's wrong with your original materials. And you got to figure that out yourself or hire a contractor to come in to figure that out. And if they can increase your percent yield from 50% to 80%, that's pretty significant savings, right? Instead of just burning, you know, cash, you're, that's, that's cash that you were keeping in your company or whatever it is. And you could pass that on to employees. You know, if you're super greedy, keep it for yourself. <laughs> A lot will go to taxes. You know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm, I'm just the chemist, right? The chemical engineers will design the plant and the business owners will run it. Big concept in the real world. All right, but pretty simple and fun to do in the laboratory. Let's do one example. Nothing really new. Uh, nothing new. Let's just do a stoichiometry one. Hope it's not a limiting reactant one. And let's calculate the maximum theoretical yield using stoichiometry. And then usually it's a part A, part B. You'll recognize these. Oh, part A, what's the, you know, how much are you supposed to get? Part B, in a lab. Let's say we did it in a lab and we got this. This is what we collected. And then you could calculate the percent yield because you need two answers. What you actually collected and what you're supposed to get. And you divide them. Very, very simple. So let's do another stoichiometry problem. You can never do enough of these. I'll put it up on the board and let's have at it. All right, write this baby down for me. For the thermite reaction, which is the Fe2O3 solid plus two liquid aluminum, we got molten aluminum, giving us aluminum oxide, Al2O3 solid, plus two moles of molten or liquid iron. That's called the thermite reaction. I've only seen, I actually saw this once. It was crazy. You can, uh, you know, go check out some videos of this. Some crazy people running this reaction. I saw somebody on video, did it on top of a car engine and it melted right through that molten iron was so hot it melted through the engine. <laughs> oh, wow. So where I was at a, uh, first started teaching in college, one of the full-time professors did this demo and they had this, this, big thick crucible and uh, and they mix these species of heated it up and liquefied the aluminum and then it just i mean it was you looked in it like a volcano and it started dripping that hole in it and it just the molten iron started just pouring through it was like whoa man that was awesome chemistry is awesome here we go so there's our reaction part a once you see the part a you know something fishy's going on what volume of molten iron can be produced if we react 72.31 grams of the Fe2O3? What is that, iron three oxide? I didn't give you any information on the liquid aluminum, so we're making the assumption that there's an exact stoichiometric amount of this or it's excess, right? I didn't, if I gave you something on the aluminum, you'd have to do a limiting reactant problem. You're like, ah. Uh. I give you the density of molten iron, obviously, because we're going to end up solving for moles of iron, convert to grams using the atomic mass. And to get the volume, mass to volume, you need the density. So let's say the density of liquid or molten iron is 6.98 grams per milliliter. Right? Of course, that could vary by temperature and stuff, but it's pretty hot. That's part A. You can kind of assume, oh, there's going to be a part B. What if we collected that molten iron, right? Be careful what you collect it in, it might melt. But let's say we could actually do this and we collect a volume. So obviously part B, I'm gonna say, hey, if this volume was collected, what would be the percent yield? So let's go ahead and pause the video for me. Just use simple stoichiometry, calculate the volume of iron, liquid iron or molten iron that can be produced from 72.31 grams of iron to oxide. Remember, take what you're given, get the moles of that species, convert to moles of that species, a simple one to two ratio, convert from moles of iron to grams of iron, to milliliters. Let's punch that up on the board. So I'm gonna pause it as well. I'll write this up on the board, see if yours matches what I have. Yay. Let's see if you got what I got. Did you get 7.25 milliliters of molten iron? Yes, 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 yes. Here we go. So walking through it, we're taking our starting amount of the iron three oxide in grams, convert that to moles using molar mass. And so based on my periodic table, we have uh, two irons. Where's iron? I have a 55.845. So we're going to multiply that by two, and that'll be good to two de three decimal places. And then the three oxygens at 15.9994. Good to four decimal places. Three is less than four last time I checked, so we'll be good to three decimal places. So I get 
0.68820 grams of Fe2O3 per mole. Remember, molar mass is always for one mole. It doesn't matter what coefficient you have in the, in the balance equation. It's per one mole exactly. Go to three decimal places. That's why I have the vertical dashed line there. So convert the grams of your reactant to moles. Then I can take my one mole of Fe2O3 and go over to the two moles of liquid iron. I don't need the state in there. Once I'm in moles of my product, I get to whatever unit I'm interested in, which is milliliters. So I'm going to take the atomic mass, the 55.845 grams of iron per mole of iron, and that gives me grams, and then I can use this density that was provided. So 6.98 grams of the liquid iron per milliliter of the liquid or molten iron. Uh, and you can welcome to cross off your units. So grams of Fe2O3, moles of Fe2O3, moles of iron, grams of iron, leaves you milliliters of iron. You can always double check yourself using a unit equation. The unit and species of interest is in the numerator or denominator based on what you're asking for, because sometimes you'll be solving for something that has units in both the unit in the denominator and numerator, possibly. But more often than not, it's just a single unit of a single species in the numerator. Boom, there we go. Make sure it's not upside down. You don't end up with, you know, milliliters cubed over, you know, your brother's shoe size or something weird like that. <laughs> if your units don't match, you know it's wrong. Double check it so that the, I've done that many times. I shouldn't tell you that, where I had some issues trying to figure out what I was doing on a test, but I knew what units I needed. So I was able to manipulate the unit line equation to get the units I was after. And I got the problem right. Yay. It's better to understand the problem though. So here we go, walk our way through. It's all multiplication division, so we're limited by fewest number of significant digits. I got four in my mass that I started with. I've got six in my molar mass of the iron three oxide. That's exact, stoichiometric factors are exact. My atomic mass is five. Remember, none of those atomic masses are exact, right? Um, the only one that is is the defined value of the carbon-12 isotope. Oh, our density, see, it's not always, see, we get in the ha bad habit of assuming the first number is going to limit our sig figs. That's not always true, my friends. Look here, the densities, densities aren't exact. That's 6.98, that's a measured value. That's three significant digits, so I'm limited to three. That's where I get the 7.2457, good to three significant figures. And again, you can go more than two non-significant digits. You can go 7.2457, stop, 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 but it's just a waste of your time. Just give me at least some, some teachers will do one. I like two because I like to know if that's, see, that's five, seven. That's higher than five, zero. So that's closer to 7.25 than it is to 7.24. So I'm going to round that up to 7.25. So that's why I like the two non-significant digits. It helps you with your rounding a little bit better. That is our maximum theoretical yield. Right? Whatever you get from stoichiometry. I obviously don't have room for part B, so I'm going to race this board, put up part B, and say, hey, in the lab, let's say we run this reaction and not die and melt through the floor. And, you know, so hopefully you're on the ground floor. <laughs> don't do this one at all. Please just watch videos. So let's say we go through and we actually do it and say you get less than that, which is usually the case. Let's say you get something like, yeah, I say 5.1 milliliters. Calculate the percent yield for me. Give it a shot while I'm doing it. Let's see you get 5.1 milliliters, calculate percent yield. I'm going to pause it, erase this board, and we'll do part B. Yay, here's an official part two, right? So part A, part B, you kind of always know. So any stoichiometry problem I throw at you, we're using stoichiometry to figure out the maximum theoretical yield. I could always stick a part B on there and say, hey, here's the actual yield. What's the percent yield? Expect that on exams. How are we going to attack this? Let's write down our equation. Percent yield is what you got over what you're supposed to get. So that's your actual, actual yield over the maximum theoretical yield. Times that by 100 to convert that fraction into a percent. Well, let's get our values. The actual yield was provided to us. So that's going to be... 5.1 milliliters, that's what we collected. Maximum theoretical yield is the non-rounded value from part A. Always use the non-rounded value. What was that, 7.2457 uh, or something? So 
So what we actually got, and that's good to two significant figures, over what we were supposed to get, maximum theoretical yield, good to three significant figures. Always use the, the non-rounded value. Otherwise, you incur, if we use 7.25, that, that would give us an answer that's too small. It's smaller than it should be. That's a rounding error. Use the non-rounded value. Always, always, always. Make sure the units are the same, right? This can't be milliliters, and that can't be, you know, kiloliters or, or fluid ounces or something. They've got to be the same unit, right? Comparing the same thing. So punch this out to two, because that hundred's exact. So this will be limited to two significant digits. I get 70.38, 70.38%. But that's good to two significant digits. That's a captive zero, so that counts. So my dash line goes between the zero and the three. Now that's closer to 70% than it is to 71% because that's less than five. So that rounds to 70%, but we need two significant digits, right? The seven's automatically significant, but the zero, a trailing zero without a decimal point is not significant. So the way I have it written is only one significant figure. Oh, naughty, naughty, naughty. So in chemistry, we need a decimal point to make the trailing zero significant. Boom! Pretty much anybody outside of chemistry would go, why the heck did you put that stupid decimal point there? Well, chemistry is all about tracking uncertainty. We're the ones who do the dirty deeds of tracking uncertainty. So I have to put that naked decimal to make that zero significant and make that two sig thing. So it doesn't happen often, but it happened this time. So learning lessons appear in the most curious of places. There you go. That's percent yield, actual yield, maximum theoretical yield for you. Not too tough of a subject. Enjoy your day.